That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about bad vegan. Does such a thing exist? Uh, <laughs> the whole title is Fame, Fraud, and Fugitives, a new four-part docu-series directed by Chris Smith, which will be streaming on Netflix March 16th, 2022. It should be called Fame, Fraud, and Fried Hair, because that the main lady's subject's hair is... I'll get into it. The it, director? Uh, Chris Smith. Okay. A documentarian. Uh, the Yes Men was, a, I think, a big title for him. Fire uh, in 2018. Um, I did see Jim and Andy, The Great Beyond, which made me feel very... Uh, it made me feel for Milos Forman on the set of Man on the Moon. Um, and he was also a producer on Tiger King. Oh, this video is probably going to be long oh. and crazy because I fucking hated this docuseries. I sat for three hours and some change. <clears throat> I couldn't have been more annoyed. It is a very frustrating and not in a good way. I don't even know if you can rightly call this documentary filmmaking. Oh, this is this is something new. We, we've entered a new era uh, in, in streaming where... Uh, I think content is just kind of being pooped out there and uh, without any kind of respect towards uh, investigative journalism. Okay, I, I want to get into that because I that is what's upsetting me the most about this. So okay, we don't... Okay. Put a pin in it because, sure. yes, I feel like I want to rant about that at the end. Okay. Okay, the subject is a lady named Sarma... Melangalis. Melangalis. She is notable because she opened a raw vegan restaurant in Manhattan called, well, she didn't open it, but we'll get into it. She owned at a point a raw vegan restaurant in Manhattan called Pure Food and Wine, mm -hmm. along with like a juice bar down the street called Lucky Duck. One Lucky Duck. One Lucky Duck. Okay. And at that time, which was like in like the, the 2010s or even... 2011, early, 2012. Yeah. yeah. It was um, like a new concept it was a celebrity hotspot, so we see people like Owen Wilson, Woody Harrelson, Bill Clinton visiting this restaurant. So Goop. Goop was tweeting about it. Alec Baldwin was there, who's integral to the story. Um, so she, that restaurant became a hotspot, and she became kind of like a notable person in that food world. That milieu. Where things take a turn is, she ends up getting arrested for fraud and grand larceny and charged and spends some time in jail and this all starts because she ends up marrying a man who says his name is shane fox but really his name is anthony strangest and he's just a con man who convinced her that there's some sort of like illuminati scientology supernatural sort of like world where if she does these certain things which all happen to be <laughs> It's explained like if she passes these tests and completes these tasks, she will ascend to like a higher level of being. But it just so happens that all those tasks, like 100% of these tasks, involve her wiring money. I mean, they didn't, <laughs> I mean, it's like Scientology. So in total, she ends up uh, wasting $2 million, giving away $2 million. But, you know, it's not illegal to throw your money away. But what was illegal is that some of that money was money that investors gave her to use on the business they invested in. And she used some of the payroll money. So that's where she got hemmed up because she stole payroll money and took investor money. That's basically mm -hmm. it. Um, ugh, should I just go? Maybe. What if I just go like episode by episode and then we can just sort of talk about the things. Okay, so episode one is called Mr. and Mrs. Fox. Sarma, she's from Latvia? She's uh, a Latvian heritage, yeah. Oh, Latvian heritage. She's beautiful. I yes. thought like if Holly Ber Halle Berry were like a, La a white Latvian lady. Yeah, she also reminded me a little bit of Virginia Fira. Um, I was getting very bored with the series, so I was trying to cast... It, it, when this is eventually made into something out like a, a fiction fictionalized feature, I could see Josh Gad as Shane and maybe Claire Danes as... <laughs> Claire Danes. <laughs> as um, Sarma. Um, but her hair... Oh, my God. There's nothing worse to me than, like... Ugh. I, I don't want to say something too bad because people might get mad. But, like, women who are not naturally blonde who do like the high lift blonde and their hair looks like Barbie doll hair. That is not a good look, people. 
If you want to be blonde, if you're not natural blonde, you want to be blonde, you need dimension in your blonde. You need like lots of highlights and proper toning if you want it to look nice and natural. But to just take some old high lift blonde and oh, I just hated it so much. And then she had a haircut and her eyebrow situation. And then there were lots of shots of her like with pigtails. Yeah. Oh, I hated it so much. She reminds me a little bit of that, that that song White Julie Brown sings in Earth Girls Are Easy. Oh, I, I want to be a blonde. No, or... I'm a blonde. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're introduced. So this story came uh, into popular culture because a reporter for Vanity Fair named Alan Sarkin mm -hmm. wrote about this story. And then it kind of got big. And then here we are. Sarkin. Sarkin. That man. He, and he, when we first see him, he said, this is a story about what is real. There's not a lot of reality uh, in any shape, sensor form. There, you know what? There is not real uh, real reporting. Uh, yeah. There, anyway. <laughs> okay. That man's hair. I. Oh another complaint of mine. I just hated how that man looked. And I don't. We've watched so many like reality shows and documentaries where people get in front of someone's camera, and they don't look their best. And they don't look their best. How about that? Hmm. Reach out to me. If you've been invited to be in front of someone's camera and you don't know what to do with your hair and makeup, you can DM me because this that man looked ridiculous. And then the docu series had the nerve to have there was one shot of him. It looks like he's in his home, which looks like it's in like LA somewhere, like Silver Lake or something. And you see him sitting in like his dining room in front of his kitchen with that old ass stove in front of his MacBook. And then the way the camera is angled up at him. And then he's looking down at it like he's doing something. And then that hair, he just, oh, I just don't understand why he couldn't look tidy and professional. Sure. but I it, hated it so much. It, it's, <laughs> it's funny how they, certain choices, it, it's kind of like how Sarma's sister has to have her bag in the shot at all times in her interview. Like, why? Why? Or there, we'll, we'll get to, there, there, there's a homeless gentleman who claims to be like best friends with Sarma. And then we get him, we, we get shots of him like being homeless and talking. Then we get shots of him looking like he's sitting in like a junkyard. And you can see the cigarette smoke coming from his cigarette, like, at, at, like out of camera shot. Like, what is happening here? Yeah, it's uh, it, yeah, looking like he's part of a biker gang. Yeah. Okay, but in episode one, we're introduced to Sarma, and she went to Wharton School of Business. She has a degree in economics. It, it's clear that she comes from like some privilege. Her, we see her, we meet her sister and her dad. Her dad's a physicist, a mm -hmm. clearly a very intelligent man. Her sister seems very put together. Um, so we're introduced to her in that way. We see that one after she finishes school, she is more focused on food, like she has an interest in food and not finance. So she does get her job, she does get a job out of college, like on Wall Street, but she's just not into it. When she meets a very handsome, popular chef. Matthew Kenny. And they get together and they start pure food and wine. But then we find out that they are like having trouble, they break up, and there is a restauranteur named... Uh, Jeffrey... Caledon, or... This man named Jeffrey, who's a super... Ch Chodoro? Some, yeah, sorry, Chodoro. Sorry to this man and his surname. He's a very successful restauranteur. He, you know, it, I mean, he talks about $2 million like it's chump change. And so... Yeah. And he's kind of like, you know, she, Sarm is paying him back a bit piecemeal. And he's like, she, like, she owed me a lot more than that. But eh. Less, we, we need to also talk about him because I feel like that's all bullshit too. Yes. But anyway, um, at a point when Sarma and this man break up, they both say to this uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey man... You need to choose one of us to stay in this restaurant because we both can't work together. And ultimately, Jeffrey says, I choose Sarma. So she buys the restaurant from him for nearly $2 million. And that's explained because Matthew uh, had a reputation for not paying people. Good and business he, practices. He didn't have good business practices. And apparently. because Sarma went to Wharton and Jeffrey also went to Wharton, he felt like she was the better choice. She had a good head, a bod for sin and a head for biz. Is that the line from Wharton Girl? <laughs> so... I don't understand the money situation. There's so many questions and so many things that are so vague, but it sounds like this Jeffrey guy gave her a personal loan that she was paying back at her leisure. I don't know, but it was for $2 million. And then it's made clear that like it was hard for her during that time. Then we're introduced to a man named Shane Fox and we get a really... We're not, we don't meet him. We, we don't meet him, but the idea of Shane Fox, 
through a really awkward tangent involving Alec Baldwin. So Alec Baldwin used to visit the restaurant. Can we can we talk about the other celebrities that they've mentioned briefly? Because I was so I was so annoyed at the mention. We're told a story about Owen, Owen Wilson. Wilson walking barefoot in the restaurant through the kitchen through out the, the back kitchen. door who are demanding you? like some pressed juice and then just walking out that is so that and gwyneth paltrow and all that that is it just makes it makes my blood curdle it's it is so annoying it is annoying. annoying okay so alec baldwin visits this restaurant and sarma's talking about him in a very sort of like vague way but implying that like he was infatuated with her and he did have weird creepy tweets he did tweet about her saying like you should well he says like you should you should visit pure food if not for anything other than to like stare at sarma because she's so beautiful okay but then she's saying that like she's implying that he was infatuated with her and wanted to like strike up a romantic relationship but that all she did was she recognized he was lonely so she kept trying to convince him to get a dog and he was like i'm not trying to hear about these damn the only bitch I want is you. So in that process of her sending him links to dogs, she finds a dog named Leon. And Leon's integral to the story because she is like, Leon's her entire world. Okay. But then because she keeps rebuffing Alec Baldwin, she thinks that that's what drove him into the arms of Hilaria, Hilaria, Hilaria. his current wife. Mm -hmm. Who he met there. Who he met at the restaurant. So then she's talking about how it's kind of like serendipitous and the universe and blah, blah, blah. Okay. But we they talk about um, how she recognized that like Shane Fox, this person Shane Fox was like tweeting Alec Baldwin and Alec Baldwin would respond to him. And then one day... She was playing words with friends. Yeah, very vague about how they one day... Very vague him. about how he ends up being like friends with her and words with friends, but they start playing a lot and he starts messaging her on the side on that platform and ultimately they fall in love. Like she's telling people that she met a guy, she's never met him, but she's in love after a few months and they're going to get married. So finally she brings him out to Manhattan. Yeah, he well, he shows up. He flies in from Massachusetts, she says, and he looks different. Than his pictures. Yeah. He's, yeah. A, he's a big man. It's also in episode one we meet a homeless gentleman whose name I don't recall. But he talks about, you know, there is some effort made to sort of paint Sarma as like this altruistic, very giving person. And this homeless gentleman is explaining like she really helped him a lot. Like she would invite him to lunch all the time and she would let him store his winter clothes at her apartment during the summer mm -hmm. which is wild yeah a homeless man's clothes in my house in the summer but later like does she have them washed first like he, I... <laughs> he does have a phone and a car we'll get to that okay okay the last note i have about episode one is you know usually when you start a docuseries like this episode one's supposed to grab you mm -hmm. and make you think like oh shit i have to finish this well, when we, when we finished episode one, I was like, there is nothing about this that would make me want to continue. Well, it, Except that I agreed to watch the, all four. The precipice that uh, episode one ends is the introduction of a character, a, a person named Wilfred Richard. <gasps> That's the end of episode one. Do you want to explain Wilfred? Okay, so Shane... Oh, I didn't even explain Shane. So Shane, who we find out is actually Anthony Strangest... In episode one, we're told that he has links to the CIA and she talks about how she w would like sort of... He wouldn't want, he wouldn't talk about work, but she would like walk in on him on his laptop and he would have like a CIA backdrop that required a passcode to get in and he'd be looking at drone footage. And then at a point he introduces her to a man named Will, like you mentioned, and he says, Will is an IT guy who works with me and you need to work with him to make sure that all of your information is encrypted, which includes you providing him with all of your passwords. And it's like... Stevie Wonder could see that this is some bullshit. And this is a big problem with this story is this Will character, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil it just yet. Okay, so episode two is called Happily Ever After. We get more about her sort of like relationship with Shane or Anthony, whatever you want to call him. It's also really frustrating... Oh well, this is the episode where she explains how they got married, which is very transactional. And everybody that's closest to her knows that she's not really in love, seemingly. No, and she even says that he keep... 
Anthony is telling her about this Illuminati, whatever, and the, the money. They, they, and the, it's called. They call them. They the, the ju- family. The family. The judges. The ju- It's very vague. Very very vague. And that the money that she would give them, they would keep it as a test. And when she passes the final test, she will get all her money back times 10. Like all her dreams will come true. Everything she wants will come true. So she's kind of talking about that. Oh my God, this marketing for this docu-series is really clickbaity because it talks about the vegan queen gets arrested while ordering Domino's pizza. That's not really how it went down. But the other thing is that she thought her dog would be immortal or immortalized, which is not really a thing either. She only mentions it once and she says it kind of like, yeah, and he mentioned that maybe like my dog could live forever and that's it. Like, <laughs> yes, it's not. I was expect based on the way this was marketed. Uh, I was expecting this to be like the Errol Morris documentary tabloid where that woman has her uh, pug cloned in South Korea. And that's really all she can talk about. Sarma is not talking about the dog or the promise of the dog's immortality no. at all in that way. So I think I think that was just a weird detail that came out in what happened in court. We also need to get to. Well, anyway, he then she something that I wrote down that annoyed me is that. Anthony would refer to her as his TBH, his tiny blonde human. human. And the reason that's important, tiny blonde human, is because he didn't see himself as human. He saw himself as like he had transcended. But then that's in conflict with... So a huge feature of this docuseries is we get a lot of shots of like the Manhattan city skyline or the bay. Just like very generic shots. And while that's happening, we hear recorded phone calls between these two dum-dums that started happening they she didn't start recording him until you know she was starting to become suspicious of the, these things and we can return to our thoughts on yeah. that but they all they do is swear at each other and they sound so dumb yeah and it it's uncomfortable to watch uh, or to listen to and, and behold the stupidity of these things because I also don't believe it's so contrived It's so contrived it's so because contrived. I, w- one I never believed that she bought into that and we can get into that after yes. you're, you're done and You know, he's clearly <laughs> But I bring up the phone calls because that's a big feature, but also related to the human thing in all the phone calls He is implying that they are both on this journey together to ascend but then in the beginning, he was talking to her like he had already ascended. So I just feel like there are so many questions I have to her. Like, she doesn't explain at all how she felt about these things or how he convinced her. In fact, with the recorded phone calls, the her attitude towards everything is like, this is bullshit, I'm not doing this. So it's like, you know, her, her defense lawyer claimed that she was coerced. It was called the. It was coercive control. And you brought up something that I think should have was we needed is a healthcare or a mental health professional explaining how that manifests in the different stages. Because as someone who is not, you know, I'm just giving my opinion, but I think it just seems ridiculous that like you were so fooled by this man and brainwashed that you gave him all your money, including other people's money. Because you really believe that you were going to ascend to a higher plane. But then there's a long period of time where you recorded phone calls where you're telling, like calling him out on his bullshit. And then somehow you still continue. And, and never invested in the higher plane. She's not interested in ne- what that's going to look like. Nope. Never talks about it. And there's also, which is suspect, she had a journal. We don't know how far this journal went back. Did she start when she was eight years old? Did she start in 2012? All in her handwriting which sort of kind of hints very ambiguously at these ideas and thoughts too. All very still vague. We need to talk about this journal because that's my next note about how vague everything is. The journal seems convenient. Like everything. It's just so hard not to get into why I really think about all this bullshit. Okay. I think... No, we have to finish. We have to finish. So it's in this episode two where we're introduced to the meat suit. And the meat suit, okay, so the instant we see a picture of Shane Fox, the minute I saw the picture of him, we both were like, oh, this is a joke. He is this pudgy, dopey guy. He is not cute. He's just big and dumb looking. And then he gets bigger as time goes on Mm -hmm. because he's just, Mm -hmm. he's not doing anything except spending her money gambling. (laughs) Oh, well, that's the gag is that 
Well, I just ruined it, but yeah. So none of this is real. He's just taking her money and gambling with it at the Foxwoods Casino. Which, which really comes out in episode three. Right. Because that's when we get uh, another strange, vague personality, this Russian named Nazim. We have to get into it. But anyway, the meat suit. Anthony's just getting fat. <laughs> yeah. And he convinces this dumb lady that it's just his meat suit and that it's like offering him protection and once he ascends and he's, it'll all well he's also being ordered to do that and he's, he, yeah. he, because he's testing her he's testing her that she really would be with him even though he's like this disgusting looking person <laughs> I mean I mean it's the way like, I'm describing it sounds like this is a wild ride but sitting there I'm just like this is so stupid someone needs to convince me that this lady really because she's not convincing me and you know why she's not she doesn't have to because she already served her time she's out of prison yeah she didn't even go to well she went to prison but for a very short time she doesn't have to convince anyone that any of this made sense so it's like watching someone who's like, yeah, I did it, and what? Well, and she, <laughs> there, there's there's this mechanism that keeps happening where she will bring it up. Like, that's that's what everybody wants to know, right? Why didn't I call the police? Why didn't I do this? And then gives doesn't really give an answer. Just gives some kind of, what was I, what else was I supposed to do? I was brainwashed. You mentioned Nazim. So Nazim is this, like, cuter, younger Russian guy who was a bartender that Anthony met and convinced him that he's a big-time guy and that... If you want, you can invest in my wife, Sarma. And this guy says he gave... First 35000 First 35000 then 100000 that never turned into anything, but then was it's, still loyal to this man. Wit for, witness to what he's actually doing with the money is in the witness, casino. Is witnessing him stealing this money from Sarma and using it to gamble and doesn't reconcile that or try to turn him in and get his money back. That, that Nassim guy seems like... I mean, it, I just think everything out of his mouth is a lie. It, it None of that adds up. Somewhere but this in, is not supposed to be fiction. This is supposed to be a documentary right. with, like, journalistic integrity. And you have this guy on the, in front of this camera just bullshitting well, us. Well, and Sarma, too. Like, nobody's asking, really drilling into her. No, they're not. And uh, at some point in, in here, was it 2014, when he's... Anthony Shane sends her to Rome on a test and uh, is really trying to take control of the restaurant. But Pure Food and Wine f closes, it shutters because they can't pay the employees and they walk. And then some time passes and she somehow raises $850,000 to reopen the restaurant, which of course uh, ends up failing again. But at that point, Nazim, because we, get, we also get some um, uh, interviews from ex-employees talking about how he was there and he was the one taking the money to the bank for payroll and he, Nazim claims it was because he didn't want Anthony to steal it but that doesn't make any sense there's either. no explanation of how or why it made sense to Sarma that Anthony would be at her restaurant running her business or that Nazim or Naz they called him was at the restaurant collecting money for pay like it just doesn't make any sense the the way that Sarma is telling her story sounds a lot like a mechanism used in True Lies, where the Jamie Lee Curtis character is, we're going to give this, her a fake mission and that's going to keep her occupied, is what that's, it sounds like. And she even says that uh, Anthony really liked movies and the way he, it, I, it clicked in, in me that what he was doing was he really liked the movie Thor and he had a thing for Chris Hemsworth and he because he also said he had some big omnipotent brother out there that oh, was, was all powerful and could do whatever he wanted at any time it's so uninteresting my final note for episode two is that we find out that in total she wired him 1.7 million dollars over between 2012 to 2014 and we see all the little western union uh it's just i mean it's just outrageous Someone has some explaining to do, and we don't get it. Okay, episode three is called No Angels in Hell. And we bled a little into that, because that's when we get We messy. did, because we find out about the casino. Um, we meet St uh, Stacy, who is Anthony's first wife from back in the day, who he met in Florida, and he um, got her pregnant and... Um, abandoned her. Abandoned her. And that lady was the only one who seemed kind of, like, authentic about what was happening. Um... She seemed authentic, and Sarma's sister and father do seem Yes, they do as well. But, um, well, what I meant really is that what happened to her, I feel like she really, really is a victim, versus Sarma and, which we'll get into, but Sarma and Anthony were trying to I think fucking con each they other. They were conning each other, yeah. Okay. Then, 
she says something really creepy. She said that because Anthony didn't want her to have this baby and then she had it. And then he tells her, you know, if you give a baby a bunch of salt, it will die and it won't show up on the autopsy. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> that that gave me the chills. Yeah. Um, okay, something that was introduced in episode three continuously that really frustrated me that Sarma doesn't explain is she says, you know, like she... Anthony kept pre all the phone calls we get, all the recordings that we hear are about him saying, are you going to wire me the money? Are you going to wire me the money? If I tell you, you're going to do it. He had all of her passwords. Yeah. So Which, why isn't he doing it? And then in episode four, we realized that when she wouldn't do it, he just logged in and did it himself. Mm -hmm. So how does that even make sense? And I think this is also the episode where there's a major spoiler that Netflix doesn't want you to know ahead of time, but... Uh, uh, what's his name? Wilfred Richard is not a real person. The that IT person who was supposed to be encrypting all of Sarma's shit and the one who she gave all her passwords to is really Anthony. But it doesn't make any sense. And then she is suspicious of him anyway, and she's sending him text saying like, "I really think this is Anthony who I'm talking to." And then there's an exchange. So the the person who's pretending to be Will that who we're supposed to think is like CIA or something, which makes no sense. It's so obvious from the minute we meet him, he's not real. There's an exchange he reads, because he's just reading all the emails and text messages, where she questions, like, I don't think you're real. And then the back and forth is like, well, he could be hiring someone to look like me and get a fake ID and then I'll show it. It's just so out of control stupid. Well, it's not a twist. It's just... It, it's, no, it's not. Even if that was a real person, Anthony is not CIA or black ops or ex-military or whatever. And, and this person, at best, would have been somebody that he was paying to help get this money from her and his, his con. The other big thing we learn in episode three is that she's trying to get... Anthony is pretending to be like a, 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 like a real estate developer or an, a restauranteur from Europe somewhere. <laughs> like that's how they get Under are. a different pseudonym. Yeah. Under the name Michael Caldrioni or something. And so Sarma is trying to connect Michael with Jeffrey, the man who's been so helpful to her. And they have a bunch of meetings where Michael flakes. And then finally we realize that Michael is actually Anthony. And Sarma knows So that. the filmmaker is asking her, well, why, why would you go along with this? And she's like, well, because that's what he was doing. And they're like, you didn't think that was wrong? Well, no, because we needed this money and that's how he was doing it. And I'm so frustrated at this person who decided to do this documentary to talk about this thing that she experienced. And then she's just being vague and... Like, what is the point? Well, because it's it's like there's hints that maybe she's bullshitting, but the Chris Smith is not also crafting any counter at all. And it's only re really the last 15 minutes of the fourth episode where we get some a flurry of theories that I believe that are that are posited by the Vanity Fair journalists. We need to take a break because this video is going to be long. And we're back. Okay, so... Episode four is called Everything Will Be Fine. Mm -hmm. So after, so then we get all this stuff about how she's not making payroll. All of her employees have walked off. We had found out in the previous episode, the restaurant had closed for three months. So now she's at the point of no return. And Anthony says, we need to get out of here. So they go to Vegas for some time. And this is where we see a lot of footage of Anthony recording Sarma in these various hotels and just showing how she's sort of like not motivated to get up and do anything and how she's reluctant to try to like help herself. She's crying. Crying a sometimes. lot. Um, then there's also... Uh, from the beginning, we never get a sense that she ever loved him or that they ever had a sexual relationship, but she does recount a story about how one day he brought back to the hotel a bottle of wine no he told her to bring wine oh no he work. told her to bring wine from work was that the last episode of the previous i don't recall but no i don't it's remember in, it's in three or four but there's a moment where she recounts a story of how anthony asked her to bring wine which was weird because he doesn't drink he doesn't drink and she's drinking and then she says he makes he blindfolds her. he blindfolds her and gets her on all fours and like makes her do stuff. Do stuff. But she doesn't say what that stuff is. But apparently it's traumatic and it ends with her saying he would never make her do that again. What are you talking about, lady? We don't know. It, they could it could have been they could have been playing Twister for all I know. Then 
This is the episode where the filmmaker is like sort of, or whomever's filming her is asking her, like pushing her a little bit because she's kind of implying that like she didn't know what to do and she, but then it's like she never reached out to her family. But then it's made very clear with the videos we're seeing and the story <clears throat> she's telling that this man, because I would think if someone is like brainwashing you and like coercion and then I think about like more popular references like those women R. Kelly had in his compound in Chicago where they were on constant, under constant watch and surveillance. They can't do anything. But Sarma's being very clear and the video supports this that she was by herself a lot. And he was trying to get her ass out of the hotel. The, so she had every ample opportunity to reach out to someone. The reference that we get here is Patty Hearst. Uh, right. Which I, I don't think really correlates either. Um, in, in that Stockholm Syndrome that Patty Hearst you know, purportedly experienced. You, you, you don't see that here. Which is why I think you need some kind of mental health expert somewhere. Yeah. Kind of weighing in on how this all played out. And how, what it looks like. It's also when they go on the run, which is for like 10 months, starting with Vegas, ending in Tennessee, that we, the entire Illuminati family they business totally evaporates. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, it no. totally evaporates. And she never addresses that. Like, I don't give a fuck about none of that shit. Right. Yeah. You lost your entire business. Like this thing that was like your life that she said was her life. You lost all of it. You're in trouble. And then it's just like, what happened to that thing that... This is what makes me think that there was something else going on, which we'll talk about. She also covers up her one lucky duck tattoo with a large band-aid on purpose and goes under the uh, alias Emma Donovan. Also, it's during this thing where he still asks, oh, we find out that Anthony was secretly talking to Sarma's mother asking for money and the mom was giving him money, totaling $400,000. I think that's so weird. Like, where did the mom think the money was going? Where does Sarma, how does Sarma think they're paying for shit? They never talk about like the time that she was gone and what happened to her apartment, who was paying for this. Like, that she never talks about how things get paid for. Practical details that really matter in a case that involves large sums of money. And b surrounding a woman with an economics degree from Wharton, mm -hmm. there's no way this lady is like, I don't know about money. I don't know. It just got paid for. There's no way. There's no way. Oh, I'm so frustrated. Um, okay. Then they move from Vegas. They, they, they do make a quick, a quick pick, pit stop back in New York to I don't know what because then they're like we have to leave no a friend she convinces a friend to give her what 60,000 oh that's or right she went to get a little bit of money they then they go down to Tennessee and this is where things get really weird because she explains like all he does all day is play video games and gamble they're staying in separate rooms they're staying in separate rooms so she, she couldn't stand the smell of him and then he's eating all this junk food including the Domino's pizza and this is where she spends her days at, Ch at a Chipotle across the street and meets this employee named Dustin and develops like a friendship with him. Because she said they were there 40 days or something. Yeah, 40 days. And uh, yeah, it's at that point that some of the investors who filed a complaint because they have been defrauded, ultimately a warrant is issued. And the police are looking for them, but they're not like America's most wanted. They're not violent criminals. So it's just kind of like, oh, they're doing their due diligence and checking whatever. And that's when a credit card with Anthony's name, right? One of their names, one of their credit cards is used to purchase a pizza. And that's how they I get I think it. it's his because they get him at the hotel. That, that's, that's right. It is his credit card. It's not even her credit card. She didn't buy the pizza and they're not staying in the same room. And when the police get to the room, well, they lure him down. They tell the front desk like, hey, can you get this guy to come down and say something's wrong with this credit card? And what he does will arrest him. So they do. They go upstairs. They see his room is fucking disgusting, filled with junk food. And they go to her room and it's immaculate. And she's emaciated because she hasn't been eating. Because I guess she can't find good vegan food in rural Tennessee. Pinch but pork. And then the court trial, the blah, 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 like whatever. Wait, it's so... We don't get any of it's that. It's so pointless going through the cops that they interviewed and how they arrested. It's, it's so th pointless. This procedural because th there's nothing intriguing. Interesting about it, yeah. Um, we do get... Uh, then then we get a... <laughs> there's a funny scene, which is annoying, of the homeless guy. We revisit him. And that's when he's like, when I found out I was going to jump in the car and go down there, like... And get Leon. And then he says, 
When he got on the freeway. No, he makes the comment, the dog ain't staying with no rednecks. Yeah, he does say that. Says the homeless man. And like, then he said he got in his car, but before he got too far on the freeway, Sarma's dad called him to say, like, Leon's good, I got him. What? My... He gets... So they both go to jail. And then says that if he had known better, he would have killed this man. He would have killed... <sighs> They both go to jail. It takes Sarma's dad a couple of weeks to post bail, but he does. So she's out on bail for most of the time. Ultimately, she's sentenced to four months in jail, prison, for grand larceny and theft. Or for grand larceny and fraud, like embezzlement. She only serves three and a half months because of time served. Um, Anthony couldn't post bail, so he was in jail the entire time. He's sentenced to a year with time served. So he actually gets out before Sarma even goes into jail, prison. And then the final scene of the docuseries is after they're both out of jail, he calls her just to say what's up, the end. And it's a record, and it's a very bizarre, and again, they're referencing kind of, kind of this beyond world, that this made up hooey that they... Oh, this video is so long. Okay, I just want to go after my after notes and you can talk about the bigger things. Any episode of Catfish is more intriguing than this shit. And that's remembering that every episode of Catfish is the same. We're going to look up on Facebook. We're going to drag their profile picture in a Google image. And still, I'm like, ooh, what's going to happen? Any episode of Catfish is more intriguing. But that's because what is good about Catfish, what's compelling and captivating about Catfish is the human component and these the people, the subjects that are authentically conveying You're right. what what and how and why and why they did yes things. that's what that's what's compelling about catfish because even though it's all formulaic and dumb it's like you're waiting to figure out why did you do this why did you approach it this way and then this stupid docu series no one including this lady wants to give us any insight into why she's not because uh, be, and i think we spent we spent like damn near an hour talking about this last night and again today kind of trying to navigate the puzzle pieces that give us a, a, a clearer answer about what she was really doing. And I think I think going back to the, the vagueness about how she was playing words with friends with him, but vetted him through his friendship with Alec. It sounds like she bemoaned a relationship with Alec Baldwin. I think it, to me, it seems like she was trying to get out from under this enormous yes. debt, even though the, the, the success of her restaurant suggested that that would happen anyway oh eventually yeah but but i just i think we get inadvertent clues to suggest that she was really conning him and then got in too deep omar epps and and just i i think at a point did become paralyzed and kind of flustered and i and think yes i agree with you i think the real story is this man saw found this lady and so, saw her as a mark like, he felt her out and realized, like, he could probably convince her of something. So he had every intention of getting money from her. But the way he did it is not what he was saying. I don't think it was this uh, Illuminati shit. I think he convinced her that if you funnel money out of your corporate, you know, your business, he had some sort of, like, something on the side. Maybe it was real estate. Maybe we don't know what it is, obviously, but something that is not this bullshit they're saying and then they both together decided that they were going to create this bullshit story in the event that this thing backfires. And then at a point when she realized, like, I'm not getting the return he promised me, that's when she started recording him. Because he even says on the recordings, Are you, is someone listening to me? So he has an awareness because she's even challenging him. So he knows something's up. So I think they're both trying to cover their asses. He's participating in these recorded phone calls because everything he's saying, I think, is him trying to be clear that you are doing all of this on your own accord because you believe you believe in this bullshit. And it's no different than people giving money to the church. Yeah. So he's not doing anything wrong. And then you alluded to her journal. That journal is bullshit. That journal is something that she started writing so that she would have something to show what he was it's doing. It's just to her. like, today's going to be my final test. Kind of nervous. <laughs> what? Come on. And yeah. Because the way that she's describing it in retrospect does not sound like somebody that actually went through this kind of psychic discord 
and and like he he slowly started presenting all this weirdness about it. But how have you interpreted that since? I, there's Sarma is such a liar. It's so obvious. Like I have a lot of experience with liars, and she is a damn liar. Like. Every, th every time she's pressed about something that makes no sense, she says, well, what was I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You're a successful business person with a, like top-notch education this is where her, this, like, is, this is where her nickname TBH should be changed from tiny blonde human to to be honest yeah like could you <laughs> could you, you could you please like what do you have to lose I, I guess at this point I know her dad is so embarrassed he seemed embarrassed he seemed embarrassed like I cannot believe that I raised this dummy and, and mom, with this awful blonde hair. And mom is not part of the docuseries. She's not. I know, well, I know she feels like a fool. There is one thing that Sarma said that I like. I was curious about and didn't make sense is that, you know, the one thing, like she says her and her mom are close. And we see emails from the mom saying, like, I would do anything for my daughter. And she says we have really bonded over this stupid thing we did. That er Well, she doesn't say that the stupid thing we did. She said we bonded over this thing we did that everyone is attacking us about for being so stupid. And I thought that was interesting, but it's just like, ugh. My last note in my thing is this lady's entire life, as she said, was built around this vegan restaurant and wanting to grow this vegan lifestyle. And throughout this entire damn documentary, not up until the very end, does she ever even talk about veganism? It's about convincing a guard in uh, prison as she was getting out that he to should eat be slightly less meat or something. And it's just as like, and but you married this big fat pig who is clearly not vegan and don't have any problem with it. It's clear based on the the juxtaposition of what those were closest to her versus those who knew who superficially said about this. We meet a pri a woman that she met in jail. Oh my God. <laughs> that was like, Ma what what's what's Queen Latifah in Chicago? Mama Matrix. <laughs> Who, who's like that type? Like I show big old lesbian. I, I show the newbies how to get blankets and sleep well. Um, and then Sarma says, you know, it's really cold in jail, and the blankets don't provide any warmth. So we just cuddled up. And and this, she seems like a very sweet, genuine person. But the she, other lady, yes. Yeah, but she seemed Clegg or something. She. Uh, her name was Clegg. Her last name. I oh. Think. Anyway. I, <laughs> She mentions that she asked Sarma, like, why she let this happen to herself. And she's like, oh, you know, people do funny things when they're in love or something. But it's clear that her friends from work that knew her best, her sister and father knew very well that she was not in love with this man. This was transactional. And even her father says, like, I wasn't worried about her going to prison. I knew she'd be fine. So all this stuff about I needed a, a big, strong man. And, and, and then she breaks up with him for a point, remember, at one point? And, and I think that she was trying to... She was trying to um, play her cards right because she gets back with him in a very strange way uh, by saying, like, I, my, I was at my mom's house out in the country in New Hampshire all alone, and that really scares me. And he, he offered to come get me. And he had his dad come get me, who we also learned from his ex-wife is a cohort in his conning. Um, oh, my God. They, these two people, I think they were conning each other. And, yes. And I think it's, an, you know, when you con... I think conning is an intricate dance and... and you know, like lying is, and you have to stick to your story to a point, and and you can't go back. And and yeah, I see what I see from this is two people that can't go back based on their own perspectives. And th this is the weird cockadoo uh, explanation we get. I can't believe we just made a forty-five minute video about this. That's as I, long as an episode. <laughs> but I want to be clear that it's not this person's story and the people who are taking advantage of that I think is stupid. It's this style of filmmaking on these platforms that are just trying to create content and it's just fluff. They're just giving us little like, like it's just clickbaity shit that like you would say at work, like, oh, this lady thought her dog was gonna be immortal and she was a vegan and got caught ordering Domino's. Like, well, how wild and crazy, but that's really not the story. Well, even how the trailer of this is with um, the one restaurant manager, Bonnie Crocker, when you get the clip of her, the meat suit, what's the meat suit? Oh my God, the meat suit. And then of course you're like, what the hell? Is she right. And then when they explain it, it's like, Nothing. It's Nothing. just another dumb detail. Well, it, I feel bad making a, such a long video over a video. something that I think is not worth the 45 minutes to watch. But <laughs> but hopefully people enjoy this more than the docuseries. I, I, I agree. I think that this style of um, documentary filmmaking is, is a detriment to the craft. Um, 
Okay. Yeah. It, I mean, there, there's no journalistic integrity at all. No. It's just put anything out there and let people say anything. And then we're all just like, I, I shouldn't have to do all this work. And like try to get on the internet and fill in the blanks and try to read about these people. Um, what would you give the docuseries? One. I would give it like 0.5. Oh, damn. I okay. was beyond it. I will say, you know, she is a striking figure to look at. It's just every time she's being... She has a pretty face. She, she does. And I kind of like the collage of photos of her more than listening to her lie to me in that chair. Anything else? No. Bye. <laughs>